Okay, so today we are going to talk about photosynthesis, and you may say why is photosynthesis important, but it is extremely important because photosynthesis is the basis of life in general. Solar energy comes in from the sun, and then autotrophs turn that energy into chemical food for heterotrophs like us. We cannot make our own food, so without producers and autotrophs performing photosynthesis, we would not survive for very long. So we're going to talk about photosynthesis, and then we're going to talk about the reactions themselves specifically. So... Photosynthesis is energy transformation. We have solar energy from the sun coming in and being converted into chemical energy in the bonds of carbohydrates like glucose, which is C6H12O6. Photosynthetic organisms are also called producers or autotrophs, and they make their own food, of course. Examples are plants, which are the kingdom plantae, algae, which are in the kingdom protista, and those are both eukaryotic and they have chloroplasts for their organelles, and then cyanobacteria, which is actually in the domain bacteria, and those are prokaryotes. So remember, prokaryotic organisms do not have membrane-bound organelles. So that means they do not have chloroplasts, but they still perform photosynthesis. So that's a very important distinction. So we're gonna talk about redox reactions. So redox reactions are reactions in where electrons and hydrogens are lost or gained. Oil rig is the mnemonic to remember. Oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. So if you remember oil rig, hopefully you can get that. So oxidation is the loss of electrons or hydrogen atoms, and reduction is the gain of electrons or hydrogen atoms. And that may sound really funny because if you're gaining something, how is something being reduced? But the important thing to keep in mind is that electrons carry a negative charge. So think about it as if you're gaining a negative charge, you actually become less, you become lower, so you're reduced. So oxidation, you're losing that elect electron, you're losing that negative charge and becoming higher to a certain aspect and reduction, you're gaining that negative charge. So things that are oxidized are going to lose electrons or hydrogen atoms, very importantly, and things that are reduced are going to gain electrons or hydrogen atoms. So when you look at that generalized equation for photosynthesis there, you have carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of solar energy and pigments yields a carbohydrate, which remembers h N is just a generalized carbohydrate plus oxygen. So if you look at these molecules and you have to decide what's being reduced and what's being oxidized. So we look at the first one, the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is actually gaining hydrogens when it is converted into that carbohydrate on the other side. So that's going to be reduced. Water, on the other hand, is losing electrons when it gives off oxygen in the other side of the equation. So that is oxidized. So carbon dioxide is converted or reduced into a carbon carbohydrate, and water is oxidized into oxygen. Now the oxygen that's given off in photosynthesis comes from the splitting of water, so that's very important. Most people assume that the oxygen comes from the carbon dioxide because it kind of makes sense. CO2 goes to O2, you just lose the carbon. But that's not how it works. Water is actually split. Those hydrogens are then used to fuel photosynthesis, and the oxygen is given off as a byproduct. So what reactant is being oxidized? Water. Water is losing that hydrogen. Which reactant is being reduced? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is gaining that hydrogen. So redox reactions recur together, so that's why we call them redox. So they're oxidation reduction reactions. So anytime something loses an electron, something else is going to gain an electron. So coenzyme NADP in photosynthesis, the whole point of it is a carrier of energy. 
So it's an electron carrier. So what happens is the NADP is going to pick up charged electrons and hydrogen and become reduced. So NADP plus that hydrogen is reduced to NADPH. Now we're going to talk about NAD in respiration next chapter, so don't get confused between NAD and NADP. Just remember P for photosynthesis. So NADP is photosynthesis, NAD is respiration. NADPH is photosynthesis, NADH is respiration. So just remember P in there. So the chloroplast is pictured there. You have light coming in. You have water coming in. Those are both necessary for photosynthesis to occur. The light reactions occur inside the thylakoid membrane there. Thylakoid membranes, remember from chapter 4, are stacked on top of each other to form what are called granum. So light and water come into the granum, the thylakoid membranes. Water is split. Oxygen is given off as a byproduct. And NADP is reduced to NADPH. So it picks up that hydrogen and it picks up those electrons. Then it's going to carry them over to the other side of the picture here for the Calvin cycle, which are the dark reactions. The Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma, which is the fluid that surrounds the granum or the thylakoid membranes. So the NADPH is going to drop off those electrons and that hydrogen, and it's going to become oxidized back to NAD+. Carbon dioxide comes into the Calvin cycle here, and then you have your carbohydrate formed. So overall, what we have happening here is we have two phases of photosynthesis. The one on the left are the light reactions, which require solar energy. The one on the right are the dark reactions, which do not require solar energy. So you have light-dependent and light-independent reactions happening. So the first stage, light, water come in through the thylakoid membranes. Water is split. Oxygen is given off as a byproduct. NADP plus is reduced to NADPH. NADPH then carries those hydrogens and electrons over to the stroma, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. It drops off the electrons and the hydrogen, becomes oxidized to NADP+. Carbon dioxide comes into the Kelvin cycle and produces your carbohydrate. So we have four inputs necessary oops, sorry, for photosynthesis to happen. Solar energy, photosynthetic pigments, water, and carbon dioxide. As you can see in the picture, the thylakoid membranes are stacked up in the grana. That's where the first part happens. The second half of photosynthesis happens in the stroma, which is the Kelvin cycle, or the dark reactions. So first we have solar energy. We need solar energy in order for photosynthesis to occur. So the wavelengths are measured in nanometers. The solar radiation and the visible light spectrum is really what we talk about and what we care about. That is what is absorbed and used during photosynthesis. So if you look at that chart on the right-hand side, gamma rays, x-rays, radio waves, we don't care about any of that. We care about that tiny little section that says visible light. And maybe you remember, maybe not, from high school, Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv is the acronym to help you remember the visible light spectrum going from red all the way to violet. So solar energy is going to be captured by photosynthetic pigments. So the pigments inside of those thylakoid membranes are going to absorb this visible light spectrum. And as I said, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So the whole point of the photosynthetic pigments, which is number two, is to absorb the visible light spectrum. So the first thing we need is light to come in. The second thing we need is for the pigments to absorb it. These are inside the plant's chloroplasts. Since we have different wavelengths of light to absorb, we need different pigments to absorb them. So the chlorophylls are the green pigments. These are the major pigments. You have chlorophyll A and B. Chlorophyll A is the main pigment. Chlorophyll B is the accessory pigment. 
Then you have the carotenoids. These are your yellow-orange pigments. These are also accessory pigments. However, what we find in the fall is that chlorophyll actually starts to break down. So since chlorophyll is the main pigment, that is what we normally see. But when it breaks down in the fall, now the other pigments can shine through. So that's why the leaves turn to browns and oranges and yellows and reds. And you have all of these different colors because that's the other accessory pigments finally not being masked by the chlorophyll anymore and coming through. So, which wavelength do the pigments collectively absorb the best? If you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you can see that the blues and violets are the best, and then the reds and the oranges. You can also see that green is pretty flat. So, which ones are the best? Violet and blue, and then red and orange. Which one is the least? Is green. So plants actually look green because the green wavelength is what is reflected back. So plants actually reflect green back, and that's why we see green plants. White are all of the visible wavelengths of light are reflected back, and black are all of the visible wavelengths are actually absorbed. So which color of shirt would you not want to wear on a hot day? Hopefully you said black because you do not want all of those visible wavelengths absorbed into your body and making you even hotter. <clears throat> so plants absorb and only use the energy in the visible light spectrum. White light contains all of the colors of the visible light spectrum. The wavelengths most efficiently absorbed are violets and blues and then oranges and reds. Least efficiently used are greens. So what color would plants be if they actually used all of the colors of light? Mm, they would be white. Okay, so the last two requirements for photosynthesis are water and carbon dioxide. Water is the reactant that's required during the first phase of photosynthesis. The roots absorb the water and then transport it up to the leaves. Carbon dioxide is the reactant during the second phase of photosynthesis, and these are absorbed through the stoma of the leaves. Now the stoma are the little holes on the back of the leaves that open and close so that carbon dioxide can get in and oxygen can get out. So water and carbon dioxide are provided by the environment. Solar energy, of course, is provided by the environment, and then the pigments are within the plants. So, some important concepts. The plant pigments absorb the wavelengths of solar energy. So if you're asked a question on a quiz or a test or something, it's plant pigments that absorb the wavelengths. For plants to be efficient at photosynthesis, they have to have these different pigments because there's different wavelengths of light to absorb. And then the solar energy captured by those pigments is going to be converted into chemical energy, like a carbohydrate. So if we look at the chloroplast, you have your picture up in the right-hand corner there. The thylakoids, remember, are the thylakoid membranes. They're the little flattened discs. They stack up and form a grana. The stroma is the fluid that surrounds those. And then the chloroplast itself is surrounded by a double membrane. So again, we have two stages of photosynthesis. The first stage, which is light-dependent and the second stage, which is light independent. So the first stage, the input is gonna be water. Light, of course, is gonna come in. The photosynthetic pigments are going to absorb that light. The electrons are gonna get excited. They're gonna jump off. They're gonna to attach to the NADP plus and reduce it to NADPH. That's then going to carry the NADPH, it's going to carry the electrons, the hydrogens, and ATP to the second stage. So in the second stage, the input's going to be carbon dioxide. It's going to use the NADPH, those electrons, and the ATP, and it's going to generate carbohydrates. So some important things to notice here. 
the first stage, the light dependent, you have light and water going in. You have oxygen coming out as a byproduct from the splitting of water. You have ATP being generated and NADPH carrying electrons. The NADPH and ATP go to the second stage in the stroma, the dark reactions, the Calvin cycle. Carbon dioxide then comes in. The NADPH drops off the electrons and the hydrogens and goes back to NADP+. The ATP is used and we generate a carbohydrate. So we have a little chart here, thylakoids versus the stroma, the first stage versus the second stage. So the first stage of photosynthesis is in the thylakoids. The second stage is in the stroma. The first stage contains the photosynthetic pigments in the thylakoids. The second stage, the stroma, is made up of an enzyme-rich fluid, which is going to catalyze the reactions, of course. The first stage is associated with what are called photosystems, which are the antennae that kind of absorb the light for the pigments. The second stage is associated with the Calvin cycle. The first stage generates ATP and NADPH, and the second stage uses ATP and NADPH. So the first stage is going to drive the second stage. So the first stage you have water being oxidized to oxygen. It's light dependent, meaning it only runs in the day and it absorbs the solar energy and transforms it to chemical energy, creates ATP and NADPH, which then goes to the second stage and drives the Kelvin cycle. Carbon dioxide is gonna be reduced to a carbohydrate. It's light independent, so it can run either day or night. And again, it's sometimes called the dark reactions. And it's going to convert inorganic molecules like carbon dioxide to organic molecules like carbohydrates. Sorry. So, first stage, water to oxygen. The hydrogen is going to supply the electrons to generate the energy. This is in the thylakoids. So the visible wavelengths of solar energy are going to be trapped and absorbed by those photosynthetic pigments and transferred to what are called photosystems. Most plants use two, the PS2 and the PS1. The two points of these photosystems are to capture that solar energy and to excite the electrons so that they charge up from low energy electrons to high energy electrons. ATP is generated on the thylakoid membrane because of the electron transport system coupled with chemiosmosis, which is just generating ATP. So here we have a picture, so you see the sunlight coming in. Photosystem 2 actually comes before photosystem 1 because photosystem 2 was actually discovered after photosystem 1, but they realized it was the first part of the chain. So sunlight comes into photosystem 2. The electrons get excited. They jump off to the NADP, creating NADPH. Energy is used to drive ATP synthesis in the electron transport chain. Water is split. Oxygen is given off as a byproduct. Those electrons then go to photosystem 2, or photosystem 1, I'm sorry, and the same thing happens. Electrons get excited. They jump off. They go to the NADPH and are going to carry to the dark reactions. So again, capture solar energy and charge up those low energy electrons to high energy electrons. ATP is generated because the electron transport chain is coupled with chemiosmosis. So we have the electron supplied by the splitting of water. Oxygen is released. The low energy electron is charged up in PS2. The high energy electron goes through the electron transport chain. ATP is produced, then the low energy electron gets recharged in PS1. The high energy electron plus the hydrogen ion is going to 
create NADPH in a nutshell. And there's a little link on the bottom there you can click on for another little review. So electrons are going to enter PS2 at position 2, and then they're going to leave PS1 to produce the NADPH. So if PS2 does not run, which products will not be made? Now remember, PS2 is the first one in the chain. So if PS2 is out, water is not going to split into oxygen. NADPH is not going to be produced. But ATP will be. So this is how ATP is generated. Again, electron transport chain coupled with chemiosmosis. So at the beginning of the picture here, you have PS2. That's the first photosystem in photosynthesis and light reactions. So energy comes in, electrons get excited on the PS2, they jump off, they go to the NADP, creating NADPH, the electrons keep going through the electron carriers as it moves down the line. Water is split, giving off oxygen as a byproduct. Then light comes into PS1. The electrons from PS2 come to PS1. They get electrified. Again, keep going through the electron transport chain, forming the NADPH. ATP is going to be synthesized this whole time because those hydrogens that we have floating around are going through the ATP synthase enzyme, so synthesizing ATP. Then the NADPH and the ATP are going to go to the Calvin cycle, where the dark reactions will occur. So the second stage, carbon dioxide is going to become a carbohydrate. It occurs in the stroma. So the dark reactions it does not require light, but it requires the NADPH and the ATP from the light reactions of the first stage. So the second stage does not require light, but does usually happen during the day because that's when the NADPH and ATP is generated because those are light dependent reactions. So three things happen to reduce the carbon dioxide. First, the carbon dioxide is fixed. Then the carbon dioxide is reduced. Then we have to regenerate our UBP. Now, if you look at that little circle on the diagram, there's a lot going on there. What you guys basically need to know is those three stages, carbon dioxide fixation, carbon dioxide reduction, and regeneration of our UBP. So, here, ADP and NADP are recharged in the first stage of photosynthesis. So we have NADPH and ATP coming in. For every 3P that are generated, five of them are used to regenerate the RUBP. And I know this is a lot of letters and a lot of terminology. Don't worry. One G3P is going to leave the Calvin cycle and actually be used by the cell. So the major inputs are carbon dioxide and RUBP. The intermediate product are two three carbon molecules, phosphoglyceraldehyde, but you don't need to know that. And then in the presence of ATP and NADPH, G3P is going to be the output. So don't worry about the names of these abbreviations because they can get really tricky. Like we have phosphoglyceraldehyde, we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and it just gets kind of tricky. So what you care about is carbon dioxide and ribulose 3-5-bisphosphate go in. 
PG is an intermediate. G3P is the major output. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is the major output. Again, carbon dioxide fixation, carbon dioxide reduction, regeneration of RUBP. I'm sorry. I'm just messing up today. So G3P is an important product of the Calvin cycle because that's the building block of a lot of other organic molecules. So G3P can become glucose, sucrose, starch, cellulose, fatty acids, and amino acid. So that G3P is really important. So as I said, you need to know G3P, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We also have different types of plants that have to fix carbon dioxide differently because they live in different environments. We have C3 plants, which are most plants that are around these areas, moderate temperature and rainfall. They fix carbon dioxide during the day. Tulips, maples, azaleas. RUBP carboxylase is the enzyme that kind of catalyzes this reaction. It has a limitation though, which is photorespiration. C4 plants are in warmer, drier conditions. So sugarcane, corn, they fix carbon dioxide during the day, but they use a different enzyme to do it. They use pep, pepsiase, basically. And they go a different route. So instead of a three carbon product, they do a four carbon product. Limitation is the ATP cost. Kim plants are in hot dry climates, so cacti. They actually fix carbon dioxide at night using the same plan that C4 plants do, but they have limitations of the cost of ATP plus carbon dioxide availability because they fix carbon dioxide at night when most organisms are sleeping. <laughs>